Amen. All right, Judges chapter 11. So, I'm going to be a little briefer on the background, but just remember Judges, we've been, after they've entered into the land, God gave them the land of, you know, they finally entered in, the next generation entered in, and we know that he warned them for 22 chapters in Deuteronomy and throughout Joshua that when they entered, in, when they entered into the land, they needed to wipe out the enemy. And when, sadly, they didn't do what the Word of God said. They didn't do what God commanded them to do. And guys, this is the danger for all of our lives. Here's the reality. Sometimes we go through trials because we're walking in the center of God's will. But I think on, more often, sadly, we go through difficulty because we're disobeying God. Can we say amen to that? The way of the transgressor is hard when we disobey God, when we walk in open rebellion to what he's commanded us to do, the consequences are heavy. So for 400 years of the book of Judges, that's exactly what takes place. They're in heavy-duty bondage over and over and over again because what happens is as soon as their deliverer, as soon as the leader left, they would run back to the world and start fellowshipping with the world and start worshiping the false gods and being involved in the immorality that went with it. And then God would allow those peoples in that land that they should have wiped out to overtake them. And then they were under bondage to those people for a period of time, sometimes as many as 60 years. Other times it's 18 years, 15 years. But eventually they cry out to God and he never brings a deliverer until they cry out to God. And so they cry out to God, he brings a deliverer, they repent, they remove the idols from the land, they start serving the Lord again, and then the judge or their deliverer dies and they go right back to the world. And so we've already seen several cycles of that, and it's gotten so bad, if you remember last time, that they cried out to the Lord and what did he say? Who remembers? Bonus points. I'm done with you. He says, I'm done with you. I've had it. No more. You know what? Every time I forgive you, you just run back and do it again. And he just says, I'm done. Run to your gods. Go to those gods you've been worshiping for the last 18 years. Go get them to help you. He would say to us today, go get your career to help you if that's the God in your life. Go get the alcohol. You, go get the whatever the thing is that is the passion, that hobby, the priority of your life, your, your bank account. Go let that be your savior. Guys, if we put our faith in anything other than the Lord, we're caught up in idol worship. Amen? So the chapter ends in chapter 10, and it's truly tragic because it basically says that God is, because they do, even after he says, I'm done with you, they do put away all the false idols, they cry out to the Lord, they took some action. Guys, it's not repentance if we just say it, it's only repentance if we do it. Amen? Amen? Repentance isn't just saying I'm sorry and living the same life. And so when they cried out and said they were sorry, said I'm done with you, well then they put all the idols away and then they turned back to the Lord. So then he did rescue them. But, or did look favorably upon them, they didn't have one person they could stand behind. They had no deliverer this time. There was no one to deliver them. And here's what happens when we start walking with the world for so long that they can't find one godly man. In all of Israel, no God, they can't find anybody that will stand for the Lord in the face of the Ammonites, will stand for the Lord in the face of the enemies that come against them. And because of that, they're in a tough spot. And so tonight we're going to see God use a very unusual man, the man they would have never expected. If you have your outline, grab it. I titled the message, the man or the woman in this case, but it's a man tonight, God uses. What kind of, it's funny, we just saw this in 1 Corinthians a few chapters back. I use almost the same title. But here we have the Old Testament example of the man, or, or it could be a woman, but in this case it's a man that God uses. First of all, It isn't usually the one we would choose. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. We see it throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. When when, when, uh, Nathan came to anoint, or Samuel came to anoint the the first king of Israel, remember he was sent to Jesse's house, and Jesse brought in all of his sons except one. He left David out in the field. His own father didn't think he was even worthy of consideration to be the king, and he left him out there because man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. The people that we think will be the ones that God will use are rarely the ones that God uses. 
We're going to see that in tonight's text. And that should be an encouragement to all of us. The Bible tells us he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. We don't need the most charismatic, the most strong, the most wealthy, the most educated. We need the person who's called and gifted by God is what we need. Can we say amen to that? And God's looking for people who are surrendered to him, not people who are educated by men. Secondly, is faithful to serve whether he's recognized or not, a person or man, a woman of humility. When somebody is striving for position, that's when I know that's the last person you want there. Amen? You want someone who will do it if no one ever recognizes them. They're not pursuing a position. They're not pursuing a title. They're not pursuing accolades from men. They're just doing it because they love Jesus. Can we say amen to that? And that's the person who will do it well. That's the person, if they're in the children's ministries, praying for the kids all week, studies the lesson all week, shows up excited, and they're coming before the Lord beforehand, and they're ministering to the kids, and it doesn't matter if anybody ever knows. We're going to see that in tonight's text. The man or woman God uses is faithful to serve whether they're recognized or not. Number three, responds faithfully when called. How many people in this room have a calling upon their life? If you're a Christian, you got a calling upon your life. God's gifted you. He saved you to use you for his glory. Can we say amen to that? Sadly, many, and I would, I would venture to guess, just Pastor Dave's opinion, most people never step out in faith to obey what God's called them to do. I would say most Christians don't step out in faith. You've heard it said that the church is like a football game. There's 80,000 people watching and 22 people in the middle of the stadium beating each other to death. And often that's the body of Christ, a lot of spectators and not a lot of people being about it for the kingdom of God. I don't think it's those, that, it's not quite that bad, but the reality is that we live in a time where we have a calling on our life and, and we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit to get out of our comfort zone and step out in faith. And that's not always easy. And the calling God's placed upon your life will be different than my calling. Amen? So we all have different callings, but we're not the body unless we're all faithful to what God has called us. I'll tell you what we're all called to do. You ready? Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. We're all called to go out and share our faith with a lost and a dying world. Amen? Is that not the great commission? The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. Amen? We're all called to do that. And we're going to see that someone who is used by God is someone who responds when they're called by God. And I want to tell you something. Most people, when they're called, it's not always easy. i got to get out of my comfort zone here. I don't know. Is this really what you want me to do? Lord, help. You know, for my whole time growing up, because my dad was a pastor, people would always ask me, are you going to be a pastor like your dad? I never even had to think about it. No. They would ask me all the time. I remember one time I showed up for the Bible study, the midweek study. I was like 15. And my dad got sick and didn't show up. And the people were like, why don't you teach? I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like a sophomore in high school. I'm like, yeah, no, he's the pastor. I'm just related to him. It's not me. But you know, the reality is that God may have a greater calling on your life than you ever expected. And the eyes of the Lord search to and fro among the whole earth, seeking one who can show himself strong on account of one whose heart is loyal to him. Fourthly, we're going to see that the person God has called uses godly wisdom in fulfilling their calling. Guys, my opinion and your opinion are irrelevant. What does the word of God say? Amen? And I tell people when I counsel them, or, and you can tell them the same when you counsel other believers, I don't have the answers. It's not me. I just know where they are. Amen? And often, you know, people say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. Give me your opinion. Really? That's just stupid. <laughs> Amen. Why would I want Almighty God created the universe who created me in his image to give me direction when another knucklehead sinner just like me could give me his opinion? So we're going to see that someone who's called and used by God uses godly wisdom. And how do you have godly wisdom? You know the word of God and you walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. How do we have godly wisdom? We know what the Word of God says. Here's the reality. Is there an answer in the Word of God for every problem in life? What's the answer? Absolutely. And you know why we're not able to give it to others? We don't spend enough time in it. 
Amen? We'll remember the song that was sang in our sixth grade, you know, we can every word that we in a song in sixth grade. But what does the Bible say about I don't, I don't know? Guys, it's we're all the body of Christ and we're all called by God to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We all should be able to share our faith. Amen. And then finally, they're willing down to lay down their life if necessary. Somebody who's going to be used by God is willing to die to themselves, die to their wants, die to their will, and in some cases, even put their life at risk if necessary, that God might be glorified. Because guys, if we have, truly have an eternal perspective, you can't threaten me with heaven. Amen? If we truly have an eternal perspective, there's nothing the world can do to me. The worst thing you can do to me is the best thing that can happen to me. Kill me right now, open my eyes in glory, and it'll be better, better than ever. Amen? And so let's begin there looking at the man that God uses. And first we're going to see, it isn't usually the one you would choose. And be careful. We have a political climate right now that if you're not charismatic, you're not winning. Is that not true? I don't like to get too political. I loved Ben Carson. I loved that guy. Loved him. He's my guy. Loved Ben Carson. He got smoked. Why? Because he's quiet. And he's humble. He's a Christian. He's got the heart of a servant. Can't have you. But you know what? Those are the people God uses. Can we say amen to that? Look at this. Begin there in verse 1. So remember, they've come to the end of the last chapter. They have, he says, you know, who are we going to have? Who's going to help us? We don't have anybody. We don't have a deliverer. Where are we going to find somebody? Then it says in verse 1. Now, Jephthah, the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot, and Gilead beget Jephthah. So Jephthah, his name means he who opens or breaks through. It also means whom God sets free. I like that. So here's a man who is a mighty man of valor. It says right here in the Bible, if the Bible says it, then it's true. Amen? And he's a mighty man of valor, and he's a man of integrity. He's a man of character. He's a Gileadite, he's a descendant of Gilead. Mighty man means powerful, strong warrior. Valor means a man of force and virtue, substance and strength. That sounds like a guy I'd like to have lead the way, amen? In a time when Israel was desperate for a godly judge and deliverer to lead them into battle against their Ammonite oppressors, he sounds like he could be the right guy. Jethro was a man gifted and called by God, but he was rejected by men. Why? Look at the rest of that verse. Because he was the son of a harlot. He was disqualified in the eyes of the people because he was born from... That word harlot can mean a couple of things. It can just mean prostitute. It can also mean that she was committing adultery with a married man and gave birth to him out of wedlock. So in the best case scenario, his mom's a prostitute. In the worst case scenario... I mean, the worst case scenario, his mom's a prostitute. The best case scenario, his mom is an adulteress. In either case, he's in a position where they look down upon him as disqualified. This is the difference between God and the world. The world judges us based on our past or our lineage or our family heritage. And the Bible says that God, man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. Often this will happen. I've had it happen more times than I can count as a pastor. People will come in and they'll let me know. They're dating, and the woman's pregnant. And they're not married, and they're broken about it. And I've had people say, well, the baby, the poor baby's a curse. No, the baby's a blessing. Can we say amen to that? I let them know the baby's a blessing, and this is not, the baby had nothing to do with this. And if you've asked God to forgive you, he'll forgive you. And now going forward, you need to honor God. You need to get married, <laughs> honor God, and raise that kid in a godly home. Can we say amen to that? We have a, a, a foul term we use for kids born out of wedlock, right? And they're looked down upon. But those are the people that God can use. And we need to quit looking at people's past. We need to quit looking at whatever heritage they have, or whatever family they came from, to determine how valuable they are in the world. Because I can tell you, God could care less what family you came from. What I mean by that is, you know, we elevate, oh, your last name is this, and you're related to so-and-so. What's that got to do with you? 
Now again, you might come out of a tough family situation that impacts who you are, but you need to know you've got a perfect heavenly father, even if your dad on earth was a mess. Can we say amen to that? And God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So they're looking from outward appearance, you're the son of a harlot, you're of no value. A week from Sunday, on, on November 4th, two weeks from, in two weeks, I'm going to go up to Northern California because one of my assistant pastors, it was, it's been at that church for 18 years, was there since the day we started, is becoming the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel Mountain View. And I asked if I would come and deliver the message, handing off the baton from another good friend of mine to him. So I'm going to go. I want to support my brother. I want to support my dear friend. He's got a radical testimony. We used to have people find out about his past at Calvary Santa Cruz, and they would come in and say, Pastor, did you know? Yeah, I know. It was 25 years ago before he got saved. He's a new creation in Christ. It's not who we were, it's who we are in Christ that matters. Can we say amen to that? And there are people that would leave the church, and I'd say, look, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We either believe that or we don't. Amen? This man's past put him in prison. A local TV station and, radio and newspapers found out, and they were going to do an article about him. I said, well, come on down to church then. And I was in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The following week, I shared his entire testimony, and instead of people being blown out, they were rejoicing because they said, you know what? That's just such a great picture of the grace of God, and now I know I can be transparent about my struggles with our church too. Amen? Beauty from ashes. Amen? They're looking at Jeff, but you're disqualified. Your mom's a harlot. <laughs> Well, nothing to do with you. He's a mighty man of valor, according to God. He's a godly man, according to God. Guess whose opinion matters? God's, not the world's. Amen? Remember that next time you're bummed out because somebody said something about you, or somebody, you know, thinks something about you at work. We shouldn't be surprised when the world looks at Christians with disdain. Guys, if some of the world isn't looking at you with a bit of an attitude, we're not living out loud enough for the Lord. Because the cross of Christ is a stone of offense. Amen? Do it in love. Be kind. Be gracious. But know it's coming. So, here's Jephthah. He's the man they need. They just don't think they want him. Again, his, wife, his mom was a mistress or a concubine or just a flat-out prostitute. And again... Certainly sinful behavior, but not anything Jephthah had any control over or any say in. Jephthah, though born through sinful behavior, was a man gifted and chosen and loved by God. But in man's eyes, he was disqualified by the actions of his parents. Guys, you and I again can make that same mistake today where we judge men and women by the world's standard or outward appearances instead of God's word and again, the grace of God. I'm glad that the Bible does not hide the frailties of its heroes. Can we say amen to that? If you go through the apostles, you know, you got, you got Peter denying the Lord. You've got, you know what I mean? You just go down the list of everybody used mildly by God, and they've all messed up. And that's a good, it's good for us to know that it's God's grace that saves us, not our perfection. We say often in Scripture is God's man is rejected in favor of one that's more appealing. Remember that when David was anointed king, the people chose Saul. Why? Because Saul was tall and good looking and David was a ruddy little teenager. But when Goliath came to town, Saul chickened out and was hiding, shaking in his boots, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit showed up when David showed up and victory came. Amen? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Joseph, was he rejected by his brothers? threw him in a pit, they were going to kill him, then they threw him in a pit, then they sold him into slavery. Joseph doesn't complain, he honors the Lord, he rises, falls, rises, falls, and eventually becomes a prince in Egypt. God had a plan for his life, amen? I want you to know that sometimes if you feel like the world looks down upon you, you're in good company. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake, for so they did the prophets who went before you. Amen? So here's Jephthah. He's a a man that God says is mighty. He's a mighty warrior. He's a mighty man of valor. By the way, when you get to Hebrews chapter 11, God's hall of faith, guess who's in there? This guy. Amen? Look what it says in verse 2. Gilead's wife bore sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, 
they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall, not, you shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So he was at some point brought into his father's house and raised there, but when his father died, the rest of his brothers said, you know, you're the mom of a prostitute, and even though we have the same dad, you got no inheritance, you got nothing coming, you need to just leave. And Jephthah doesn't get what he rightly deserves. I think it's interesting in the Bible, we don't see Jephthah complain about it. We don't see him murmur. We don't see him say that's not fair. But we're going to see God use him in a mighty way. Gilead had legitimate sons by his wife, and when they grew up, they drove Jephthah out. And here we, here we have just one consequence of having sex outside of marriage. It, it divides a family. Can we say amen to that? There's kids that don't feel part of the family because, and it, it's not, did Jeff, is this Jephthah's fault at all? It, does he have anything to do with it? And yet he's bearing the consequences of it. Just goes to show you that our sin impacts more than just us. Can we say amen to that? If I choose to sin, it impacts my kids, my, the ministry, and people, it impacts, guys, the enemy will tell you you can sin and no one will know and God will forgive you. And the truth is, our sin will surely find us out when have an impact on those that we love the most. Let's be people who walk in holiness before God. So they drove him out and said to him, you know, you have no inheritance in your father's house. Again, the legitimate sons refused to give Jephthah his portion of his father's inheritance. They gave him nothing. They sent him packing, packing because he had a different mother. Guys, we live in a world today that is so filled with, you know, Combined families. Can we say amen to that? Kids from this marriage, kids from that marriage. And God's highest is that they're all one big family. Amen? But some of you who are in that, you know that's not always easy. But in this case, it's not the child, it's not Jethro's fault. So little did they know they were rejecting the future judge of Israel. We're going to see before the end of the chapter, these guys are going to stand there and find out, oh, the guy that we kicked to the curb that we said we don't want to be our brother and we want nothing to do with, uh, he's now the judge over all of Israel. And too often when we reject God's highest, we miss out on God's highest. Amen? We miss out on God's plan. Again, God uses outcasts. And Jephthah would indeed be the man that God would use. And while man looking on the outward appearance rejected him and even sent him away, God had a plan that could not be altered by unfaithful men. God uses outcasts all over the Bible. That encourages me. How about you? How many of you guys have, probably going to be very few hands, how many of you guys have even heard of the book Harvest about the beginning of the Calvary movement? Me and Pastor Mark. Anybody else? Rob, Daniello. It's the story of how Calvary Chapel movement started, and when you read through the book Harvest and you see all the first Calvary Chapel pastors, they're a mess. Drug addicts, hippies, train wrecks, gangbangers, Raw Reese, waiting with a loaded gun to kill his family when they got home, bangs on the TV, and Chuck Smith comes on and he gets saved, and now he pastors a huge church in a little bit. God thinks the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? I've heard pastors mock the Calvary movement. Well, we got a bunch of hippies and stuff for pastors. What were the apostles? Were they a bunch, of, a bunch of Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew, you know, were they graduated from? No. They were simple men who had been with Jesus. Amen? So here's Jephthah. He's going to be that outcast. So the man God uses, first of all, isn't usually the one we would choose. This isn't the guy you would think of. Out of all of Israel, this is going to be the guy, the son of a harlot, kicked to the curb by his own family. Can't be that guy. That He's not even on their radar as being the guy. Verse 3 Point number two is faithful to serve whether he's rest, recognized or not. Look what it says. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob. And worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. So here's what he does. He's cast aside by his brothers. He goes down to Tob. What you need to understand is Tob is, is about 80 miles away from where he was, but he's right there on the border of where the enemy is. So even though his family kicked him to the curb, he didn't give up. He went and did what he would have done if he was called to be the judge. He's going to go down and confront the enemy when nobody else will. He's going to be the one that goes down and makes a stand for the people of God when nobody else will. 
He's a man who's going to gather people unto himself. And notice what it says, a bunch of worthless people. Remember David's mighty men? Remember David's men, right? When he's running from Saul? And he's got a ragtag group of folks. And same thing here with Jephthah. He's got these guys who, and the word worthless doesn't mean they're, it just means they're broke. Original language, they're poor. Took a bunch of poor folks and they went. Now, the word raiding there isn't the best translation, but it, what it literally means is they were, and I tell you, know, by the way, if you got a good translation, look at there in verse three. Is that word raiding in italics? Here's a Bible lesson for you. If that word's in italics, it means that that word is not translated directly from the original language. It's a word that was added by the, the transcribe or the editor so that to give us better understanding. Okay? So when you see a word in italics, often it's there so we understand kind of the connotation of the words around it, but it's not a direct translation from the text, the original text. Does that make sense? So the word of God, that's why it's good that it's in italics. But we also know that it was put there based on the the under, their understanding of the original language, how the best translation would help us to understand. So a rating that's put there uh, to clarify meaning, he led these men not raping and plundering, but more like David, who fleeing from Saul would put raids on the Amalekites, the enemies of Israel. He wasn't going to get rich. He wasn't going uh, to do ungodly things. What he was doing was he was attacking the enemy when nobody else would. He was standing for God when nobody else would. And he's doing it when no one else is recognizing that he's even doing it. He's not worried about what people think. He's not striving for a position. He's not trying to be noticed. He's just being obedient to what God's calling him to do. And he's doing it even when nobody knows. He bands together all these men who are much like him. Nowhere else to go. Men who are not mighty from the world's perspective, but though rejected by his own, Jeff is a mighty man of valor, gifted by God to lead, and he uses his gift in leading others. You know, when someone's truly called and gifted by God, often God's going to use them to lead those and exhort those and encourage those and strengthen those who are weaker in their faith. I love hanging out with people that are, just in fuego for Jesus. How about you? I love hanging out with people that are on fire for God. I love hanging out with people that have been through incredible trials that it's hard for me to even understand, and their faith in God hasn't waned one bit. That's somebody I want to hang out with. How about you? And sadly, too often, we hang out with the world that draws us away from God instead of hanging out with people that draw us closer to the Lord. Amen? So here's Jethro, rejected by his family, but still being used mildly by God. And again, too often, well, if the world doesn't think much of me, if my family doesn't think much of me, then God's not going to use me. Foolish things of the world to confound the wise. David, rejected by his family, king of Israel. Joseph, rejected by his family, prince in Egypt. Amen? doesn't matter what the world says, it's what does God say. You know, on Judgment Day, your boss is not going to be there to talk about you. Amen? On Judgment Day, the people in your family, that are, it's going to be me, me and Jesus. Amen? And that's the relationship that matters. And here Jephthah, rejected by men, is going to be used mightily by God. He made raids on Israel's enemies, including the Ammonites, while the rest of Israel was without direction and all but hopeless before its enemy, lacking wisdom, lacking direction, lacking leadership. You know what they needed? Jephthah. They needed a man who was sold out for God. They needed a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. They needed a man who was unafraid and unashamed to do what God has commanded him to do, who wasn't looking to be popular with men, but to be faithful with God. And you know what? That's what America needs today. Can we say amen to that? We need people who are unashamed of the gospel. It's not apologize for the Bible. Amen? Preach it, but preach it in love. The only one making any impact on the enemy was the one who had been sent packing by his own family. The only one being faithful to what God would call the people to do 
It's one that nobody else wouldn't have anything to do with. We need to be careful. Amen? Not to judge the way people the way that the world does, but the way God does. So point number one, we see if a man of God isn't usually the one we would choose. Number two, is faithful to serve whether he's recognized or not. He's a man of humility. Not looking for a title, a salary, or position. It's not about him, it's about the Lord. Number three, responds faithfully when called. Let me ask you a question. Couldn't Joseph have just smoked his brothers when they finally showed up and were starving? Really, remember me? Threw me in a pit. Remember that? Forgot about me? Guess what? Told you I'll be bound. Remember I had the multicolored coat and I told you I'll be bound? Here you are. Doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't seek vengeance because he's a man after God's own heart. He's a man that seeks the Lord. He's a man that desires to walk in the center of God's will. Jephthah could do the same thing. But you know what? He's going to be a man who holds no grudges. Look what it says there in verse 4. It came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jethro from the land of Tob. What happened? Here's what happened. The enemy starts fighting with them. They have no leader. They have no direction. They have no wisdom. And then the word comes to them. There's this guy named Jethro. He's down in Tob, right on the border of Ammon, and he's fighting against the Ammonites, and he's having great victories down there. And they don't have a leader. And they don't have anybody. They don't have any direction. So what do they do? Dude, go get that guy. Go get the one guy that seems to have a clue right now. Go get the guy that seems to have some direction. Go get the guy who's brave. We're all shaking in our boots up here. We don't know what to do. Go get him. Notice, they don't go get him because he paraded himself. They didn't go get him because he had a campaign, make me king or make me deliverer. He wasn't striving for position. You know what he was doing? He was just being faithful to what God called him to do, even if nobody was watching. Can we say amen to that? Wasn't King David doing the same thing? He's out fighting, he's out protecting sheep, fighting lions and bears when nobody's watching and had no idea that God was preparing him to fight an 11 foot, 750, 750 pound Philistine giant. He was faithful when no one was watching, so God used him mightily when everyone was watching. Amen? Guys, it's got to start with us being willing to serve when nobody's watching if, and if we serve and no one ever sees because we're doing it for the Lord, not for the world. Amen? But often, those who are faithful when no one's watching, when they have the heart of a servant, often those are the very people that God will then use in other places as well because he knows they've been faithful in anonymity, and they won't allow the glory of God and the blessings of God to be used in a broader way to, to take any credit because they're willing to do it with not, without any accolades. So some time after Jethro had been expelled from his father's house and become known for his military exploits, the people of Ammon made war against Israel, passing over the Jordan, attacking and oppressing the people. The people are lost without direction. They have no hope. They have no answers. And again, having cried out and truly repented, they removed the idols. They're serving the Lord. But as it says back in Judges 10, who is the man who will fight against the people of Ammon. He should be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. The Lord makes them aware of Jephthah's exploits. His own brothers didn't want him. The elders of Israel needed him, and they went to him themselves, 80 miles to Tob, to ask him to take charge. His own family sent him packing, and now the elders of Israel are going to come and say, could you please come and help? His own family, get out of here. Mom's a harlot. You don't rate. You got no inheritance coming. Go away. We're through with you. And then the elders of Israel come running going, dude, we need you. Why? Because he's being a faithful man of God, the kind of man that God can use. He'd been faithfully batting the, the enemy in relative anonymity. Now he would be called on to lead the nation into battle. They saw him as the only person who possessed the qualities needed. Again, faithful in the small things, being used by God in the greater things. So they said to Jephthah, verse 6, Come, be our commander, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So Jephthah said to the elders of Israel, Did you not hate me 
and expel me from my father's house? You know what that tells me? I have an idea one of his brothers is one of the elders. Amen? The elders didn't kick him out of his house. His brothers did. So here comes a group asking Jephthah to come, and maybe more than one or at least one was his brothers who kicked him to the curb. And now they're showing up, hey, we need your help. Don't you guys hate me? Didn't you guys kick me out? Didn't you send me packing? This is Jephthah's response. But notice, he's not going to hold a grudge. He says, why have you come to me now when you are in distress? Why have you come to me now? Why have you waited until now? You didn't need me before, but you need me now. Let me read to you from Judges 16, verses 13 and 14. Look in there later. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. He said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into a, into a womb, so she wound it tightly into a loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you and Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the baton and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? See, so often we live in a world where they judge they judge our value to them by us giving them what they want and doing what they want. She cons Samson and tries to get him to give him the secret to his strength, and he doesn't give her the answer she's looking for, and now she makes accusations against him. Jephthah's standing there. His own brothers had accused him. His own brothers had looked down upon him. His own brothers had sent him packing, and now what does he do? He makes a stand for the things of God. When dividing their prosperity, they sent him packing, and now in desperation and difficulty, they cry out for his help. Either the elders had helped him with his expulsion, or some of them were his brothers, and I think that's probably the case. So how does Jephthah respond to hearing this? Okay, now you're, you're in distress and you want my help. He could have said, too late. Talk to the hand because Jeff is not li listening, right? Could have just given him the Heisman, right? Get away from me. I'm done with you. I'm not going to help you. And you know what? We need to be careful not to fall into the trap of, you know, trying to overcome evil with evil. Amen? Waxing people out of our life. We shouldn't be surprised when people act ungodly. And so here's what Jeff does in verse 8. 8 and 9. The elders of Gilead said to Jethro, this is why we have turned again to you now that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be the head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jethro said to the elders of Gilead, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? Here's what he says to them. If you take me back and God brings the victory, are you going to put me in a place of authority? Is that what you're going to do? But I want you to notice something. Some will say he's like bargaining because he wants position. I think it's just the opposite. Here's what he's saying. If God brings the victory, he didn't say if I bring the victory, if I go back and show you what a mighty warrior I am, he said if I go back with you and God brings the victory, are you going to then put a man who submitted to the Lord in the place of leading the people? Because see, they've been living 18 years serving idols. They've been rejecting God and living contrary to his will. So now here we are, and he's saying to them, if God brings the victory, are we as a nation getting our eyes back on God? Are you going to allow me to lead you so that we put our faith and our hope completely in the Lord? That we continue to repent and turn away from the false idols of this world? You know, often you know, people pray when they're in desperation, and the more they get out of their desperation, the less desperate for God they are. You guys have heard about it, right? The guy, you know, the illustration, the guy, his boat sinks 50, yard, 50 miles off of shore. And he's, he's stuck. And he's starting to swim, and he's got a little piece of wood holding him up, and he's, Lord, if you get me to shore, I'll sell everything I have. I'll, go to, I'll, I'll give all my money to the church, and I'll be a full-time missionary for the rest of my life in India. He gets 20 miles offshore. Well, Lord, if you get me there, I'll sell everything I have and give it to the church, but then I'm going to stay where I live and stay, you know, and then he's five miles away. Well, I'll go back to church. And he's a mile away. I'll do the best I can to go on Christmas and Easter. Gets to the shore and forgets what he even promised. 
And too often, this is what happens. Jeff is saying, look, you want my help now because you're desperate, but when this is over, are we going to serve the Lord together? Are we going to make God the priority? Is this the desperation prayer that we pray and then we forget all about it when we're, when we're delivered from whatever that scary moment was, whether it's our finances or our health or something? Oh, Lord, please let me not have this de- delivery. Let the cancer, let the thing be negative. Please, God, I'll serve you. Oh, and then you forget about it. Jeff is asking him before the battle even begins, if I follow, if I go with you and God brings the victory, are you going to let me lead you to continue to follow God even after we're no longer desperate? Too many people have desperation Christianity. I only pray when I'm desperate. I only pray when it's difficult. I only cry out to God. Guys, we ought to be crying out to God all day, every day. Pray without ceasing, for this is the will of God. Can we say amen to that? Verse 10. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do so according to your words. The elders make the most solemn oath before God that if they were not faithful to their word, the Lord would take vengeance on them for it. Lord, if you come back and lead us and God brings us victory before Almighty God, we will follow with you and we will put our eyes back completely on the Lord. That's what he's saying. And they make this commitment before God. And Jethro calls them to honor the Lord going forward. Then it says there in verse 11, Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Jephthah came down from Tob. People made him both captain of their military forces, but also their chief ruler and governor over all the people. And again, I wonder how his brothers must have felt at that ceremony. They bring him in, and they here's our new commander, here's our new ruler, here's the new judge that we're all going to serve, and they're all there, and not too long before that, they told him, you're not even worthy to be one of our brothers, why don't you just go away? We don't ever want to see you again, leave. And often God will allow difficult circumstances to bring restoration. Can we say amen to that? If they weren't fighting an enemy that they couldn't beat without his help, they would have never cried out. And I praise God. Look, I pray this for my kids all the time. When my kids are not where they need to be spiritually, my prayer will be, God, do whatever it takes to get them desperate enough to cry out to you. Can we say amen to that? And I'll pray that with you guys sometimes. I've been praying. People say, yeah, I got a son or a daughter or another family member that's just totally, and I'll say, Lord, do whatever you got to do to get their attention. And then people come back, we prayed for him. He got a bad car accident. Now he's in the hospital. What happened? God answered our prayer. Amen. Lord, do whatever it takes. We don't have Jethro's recorded prayer, but who knows? Lord, do whatever it takes to get my brothers desperate for you. And God's done it. So point number three there, he responds faithfully when called. He doesn't hold grudges. He could have taunted his brothers. Oh, you need me now. What are you going to do? You want to kick back down some of that inheritance you told me no about? I didn't do that. Didn't hold it over them. Didn't mock them. Obey God. And it's easy for us to fall into the trap of wanting to get even. So they pronounced him, you know, renounced him, sent him packing. Now he comes back. And again, often God doesn't give us what we want or think we deserve because God has something far better. You know what? If he had just been given that inheritance, he might have stayed there and been comfortable. And because he got no inheritance, he went all the way down to Tob, 80 miles away on his own, rounded up a band of misfits and started fighting the enemy when nobody else would. You know what? Sometimes God takes us out of our comfort zone so that he might use us for his kingdom and for his glory. Can we say amen to that? Praise the Lord. Point number four, uses godly wisdom in fulfilling his calling. By the way, Mizpah, I want to say one thing. That's where the congregation gathered together, where God's glory dwelt, uh, where where the, you know, The tabernacle was, and it was there that they made this oath before the Lord. They repeated before the people and in the presence of God's glory, and it applies an inauguration into his office as judge, and it would have been a time of prayer, a time of blessing, and more than likely a time of sacrifice. So all this took place, and now this man who'd been thrown aside has been recognized this is the man that God wants to use. Now, verse 12. He's going to use 
godly wisdom in fulfilling his calling. Now, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, What do you have against me? You come to fight against me in my land. So Jephthah, a man recognized now, called by God, recognized by men, immediately begins to pursue resolution with his enemy. And the actions reflect godly character. Though a courageous and mighty warrior, he sought first a peaceable resolution because his thought was to protect his people from war. So here's a man who's going to use wisdom. He's going to try to reach out to the enemy and say, what do you have against us? Can we not negotiate first? War shouldn't be the first place we go to. Amen. So here he is, though, and he's going to reach out. He's using godly wisdom. He's going to reach out to the enemy and see He seeks a peaceable resolution, but also asserts the ownership of their land. Because notice he says there, what have you done to come fight against me in what? My what? What does it say? Land. This is my land. You know who gave him that land? God did. Amen? And he's going to say to them, why are you coming against me in my land? They're not going to like that. Because they think it's their land. Gee, there's nothing new under the sun. What's going on in Israel right now? Are they still fighting over whose land it is? It's Israel's. By the way, Jordan belongs to Israel. Amen? Most of the nations surrounding them, at least portions of them, all belong to Israel. And before it's over, they're all going to be Israel. Amen? God's not done. But he's... He's willing to reach out to try to bring restoration, but he's not going to back down from God's promises at the same time. Guys, we don't want to be so desperate to reach out to the world that we deny the truth of what God has commanded us to do. Can we say amen to that? You see too many churches today and too many Christians dialing down the message and making it softer not to offend and and trying to be more like the world so the world will accept them. I don't care about being accepted by the world. I care about being faithful to God. And so he's reaching out, but he's not backing away from the truth of God's promises, even in the face of the enemy. And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of what? Egypt. When did that happen? How long has it been? Those people are all dead. Amen? Amen? And he's going back to a time, first of all, he's, he's not accurate. We're going to see in a moment. The whole reason he's mad isn't even the truth. And he's going back to long before, because when you guys came out of Egypt, you know your ancestors, way back, they all died in the wilderness, right? Except for Joshua and Caleb, and now they're dead too, because time has gone by, right? All of them, yeah, well, they came and they, well, first of all, it's not even accurate. But we live in a world right now where people will hold grudges on stuff that's not even true. Is that not true? It happens all the time. And that's the king of Ammon. But you know what I love about this? We're going to find out that Jephthah was a man of the word. Because Jephthah is about to correct him because he knows what the Bible says. The book of Numbers had already been written. Amen? He knew exactly what had happened. And he's going to replay the word of God back to them. Guys, when we're going through these kind of difficulties of life, it's not giving them our opinion. It's not giving them the law of the land. It's giving them the word of God. Amen? And watch what happens. And I love this. God bless this guy, rejected by his own family, but he knew what the word of God said. He said, from Aaron, Arnon, as far as Jabok, and to the Jordan, now therefore restore these lands peaceably. You want to avoid the war? Give us all your land. Give us the land that God promised to you. Give us the land that God told you you would inhabit. Give it to us, and we'll see what we can do. Disobey God. Don't obey what God has commanded or what God has called you to do. Do just the opposite. Look what happens. So Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of Ammon, and he said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt... They walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Sodom saying, Please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. And in like manner they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. 
And they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, came to the east of the land of Moab and encamped on the other side of Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, or Arnon was, for the Arnon was on the border of Moab. He tells them a history lesson that is, comes straight from the Word of God. And guys, the world we live in today tells lies like nobody's business, and the truth is found in the Word of God. Can we say amen to that? Just recently, um, there was a post, and I was having a discussion with somebody, and the person said on there, well, the Bible taught there were homosexuals all throughout the Bible, and God ordained it, including the, the man, the, the centurion who said, come and save my servant. And the word for servant there is this word, and it means his homosexual partner. And I'm like, bro, it cracks me up when people who never read the Bible get something out of context from somebody they read it from. And so we had to have a little Bible lesson. Well, that, first of all, it's not what it says. Can you say amen to that? And they'll say it with enough authority. And that's what's happening here. You stole our land. Give it back. Well, actually, let me tell you what the Bible says. Let me tell you what really happened because God told, says it, wrote it down. And here's what really happened. And that's not, what you're asking me is not true. This is what's true. Evolution is a lie from the devil. God created man in his own image. And God's not an amoeba or a monkey. Can we say amen to that? Didn't go from the goo to the zoo to you. God created you in his image, created man as a, in the image of God. And again, people will buy the lie because if people shout it enough and tell them enough, they'll start to believe it. Guys, that's why we need to read the Bible so we don't buy the lie. How do we know a counterfeit? I don't have to read the Book of Mormon. Amen? When the Mormons come to my door and start speaking, I know that what they're telling me is contrary to this because I know what this says. Can we say amen to that? They give him, they feed him a line. Jephthah could have caved. Well, that, that didn't happen. Let me tell you how I know because I know what the Word of God says. Here's what the Word of God says, and here's what happened. Guys, we should not apologize for the Bible. I know I've said that three times tonight. Too often we, well, the Bible says, I don't want to offend you, but let me just tell you what it says, and I'll try to say it nicely because I don't want to hurt your feelings. If the Word of God hurts your feelings, your feelings need to be hurt. Can we say amen to that? It's not about what we feel. It's what the Word of God says. This is the authority. Our feelings lie to us all day. The Word of God never does. So Eden were the descendants, as we know, of Esau and Moab were uh, descendants of the incestuous son of Lot. So they're related to the Israelites, but they still won't even let them walk through their land when they say, you know, we just, we'll get some water, but we'll, anything we touch, and we just want to get, and they said, no, we don't want anything to do with you. And yet God continued to bless. They asked permission. Each time we're denied, they denied Israel and Moses, they bypassed the land. It has, it's not even close to the story these guys were telling. So in verse 19, it says there, Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please, please let us pass through your land. So now, who is he talking about? He's talking about the Amorites. And he says to them, Hey, you know, your people. We talked to Sihon and asked for permission. We didn't take anything from you. Remember Sihon, he's a, what is he? Who remembers He's a scion and og. They're both what? Kings and something else. Giants. They're giants in the land. The very giants they had feared. They're giants in the land, both of them. Sihon and og. Okay, I think it's og that was buried in a, in a sarcophagus. To, you know, it, was like, it was like 20 feet, you know, 11 feet wide. Big dude. And so he said, look, we, we approached him. He knows the truth because he knows the word. Amen? They're telling him a lie. He takes them back to the truth. He doesn't listen to what they say. He goes right back to the word of God. May that be a lesson for all of us. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through the territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped in Jahaz and fought against Israel. He's saying, you know what? We didn't attack you. You attacked us. You're saying we came into your land and stole it from you and attacked you. That's absolutely not true. We asked permission. You wouldn't let us come, and then you attacked us. That's the truth. Guys, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? It says there, 
And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possessions of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited the country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites, from Arnon to Jabbok, from the wilderness to Jordan. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? I love this. You want the land back that God gave to us when he defeated you because you guys would not allow us to pass through your land. You guys disobeyed God. You rebelled against God. You rebelled against his people. God brought righteous judgment. And now you're telling me we stole your land. No, God took your land because you disobeyed God. Amen? Guys, a man God uses has godly wisdom in fulfilling his calling because he knows what the word of God says and he's led by the Holy Spirit. He's speaking with boldness. It's interesting, in verse 22, it says from the wilderness of Jordan, what, what is the uh, capital of Jordan today? Who knows? Ammon. Ammon. Where did they get that name? Ammonites. Amen? So Jordan is God's too. Jordan belongs to Israel too. Amen? They're fighting over the land. They're trying to take land back. And the reality is, it all belongs to God's children. And guess what? Before it's over, Israel's going to have it all back. Verse 23, and now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites. You say you should possess it. Again, he's speaking the word of God. God uses a man of the word. He refutes the lies of the Ammonite king with the truth of God's word. And guys, when we get into a discussion with somebody, always take them to the word. We don't want to win arguments. We want to win people. Amen? And the way we do that is faith comes by hearing and hearing by? Not my opinions, the Word of God. So get them to the Word of God. God's Word doesn't return void. My opinions do all day. Can we say amen to that? So let's give them the Word of God. And this is all he's doing. He's just giving them the Word. He knows from the Word. He knows the history. He knows the truth. And guys, sometimes we feel ill-equipped to have that discussion. And if we're ill-equipped, it's because we don't read this enough. Can we say amen to that? Desire the Word of God more than your necessary food. We talk about this all the time. Can you imagine you open this as much as you open the fridge? We'd be a bunch of skinny spiritual giants. <laughs> Amen? I, I feel a little equipped. It's not because God doesn't want to equip you. It's because we don't make Him a priority. Let's finish up. And now... Are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? Who was Balak? Who did Balak hire? Who did he hire? Balaam. And he tried to get Balaam to prophesy against God's people. You remember that? And Balaam took a bunch of money from him, and then he couldn't do it anyway. Balak didn't want to fight Israel. He was at least smart enough to know if we fight Israel, we're going to get smoked. So i got to figure out a way to get God to curse his own people, which is just stupid. But, so he does it, and Balaam is so thick that, you remember, he's riding on a donkey. What happens? Shrek. Shrek. Donkey starts talking to him. Hey, bro. <laughs> he falls to the ground. He's beating on him. You know why he won't move? Because there's an angel standing there with a sword about to lop their heads off. Dude, do you not, do you not see the angel right there, bro? If you want to die, you keep going. I mean, the pastor, you know. And then he answers the donkey back. This is the guy they're trying to get to curse God's people. So here's Ben. Does he know the history of what happened? How does he know this? Because he knows the word of God. By the way, it was a lot harder to read the word of God for Jephthah than it is for you and me. Let's go find the scroll. We got one. Let's go find it. Unravel that thing. Hey, sitting in synagogue, Right? We got more Bibles than, you know, got so many versions of the Word of God. And I'm going to take the one that matches my purse tonight. That's I got the green one. We got so many Bibles. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages in Aror and its villages and all the cities along the banks of Arnon for 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? If this was your land, it really belonged to you. They were there for 300 years. Why don't you do something then? Again, he knows the truth because he knows the word. He has wisdom because God is speaking through him. Again, he's a man that God can use. You know what? 
You got a problem? Why hasn't your God done something? That's what he's basically telling them. Where's your God? Why, why haven't you defeated us? Where's your God? Go get him. You go get your God, I'll get my God. Let's see who wins. Amen? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon or towns, Again, Heshbon is a town, it's a disputed area. Jephthah's point is, why in 300 years didn't you claim your land? Again, armed with truth, it's easy to refute lies, isn't it? If you know the truth, it's easy to refute a lie. It's easy to say that's nonsense. When I responded back to that guy, I said, well, first of all, the word in the original language is not that, it's this, and here's what it means. It means servant. It doesn't mean, first of all, there's no word in the Bible that means male, you know, homosexual marriage companion. It's not it. Other than maybe in Sodom. Amen? How'd that work out? But when you take the truth, well, actually, this is what the word means. This is what it means in original language. Here's what it means in its context. Here's the whole story. You're parroting something you heard from someone else who's never read the Bible. Amen? We need to know the truth and speak the truth. It refutes the lies. Then it says there in verse 27, remember this is Jephthah speaking to the Ammonite king. He's speaking to the enemy that's oppressing them at the moment. Here's what he says. Therefore, I have not sinned against you, but you have wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. However, the king of the people of Ammon did not heed the words which Jephthah sent to him. Here's what he says. Let's let God be the judge. You want to just do that? Let's just God be the judge. Let's see how that works out. And here's what happens. Because men are prideful, instead of backing up and saying, let's seek God's answer, here's what they're going to do instead. They're going to attack. Isn't that what prideful people do? Isn't that what godless people do? They operate in the strength of their flesh instead of submitting to the perfect will of God. Last point. Willing to lay down his life if necessary as a man that God can use. We're going to finish in verse 33 because verse 34 on really goes into chapter 12. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it as a burnt offering. Next week is a gnarly text. Who knows what comes out to meet him? His daughter. He's making a rash oath he didn't need to make. Amen? He didn't say, God, if you'll give me what I want, then I'll give you... Guys, we don't have to bribe God. God's going to do what's right without us bribing him. Can we say amen to that? God, if you'll just do it, then I'll give you this. He didn't, he didn't need any, does he need anything from me? And he's going to make a rash oath here. Now, he's being used, it says he's filled with the Holy Spirit when he does this, which proves that even when we're filled with the Spirit, we can make the wrong choices sometimes. Can we say amen to that? That's exactly what happens here. Lord, I'll give you whatever comes out the door. It's heavy-duty stuff next week. He's empowered to love, to serve, to witness. Empowered by the, the Holy Spirit, he gathers the army, he readies for the battle, and then he goes out to fight, but he makes this vow before the Lord. And again, though well-intentioned, this was a foolish vow, as such vows can be an attempt to get God on our side, when the reality is we don't try to get God on our side, we just need to get on his side. We don't need to bribe God to get on our side. We just need to say, Lord, where's your side? I want to be on that side. Amen? Do you see the difference? You know, God condone what I'm doing as opposed to God tell me what I should do. Amen? And last verse, it says there in verse 33, verse 31, excuse me. And then it will be what, whatever comes out there. Verse 32, so Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Aror as far as Meneth, 20 cities, and Abel Kiramim with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. They went from being scared to death of the enemy to a mighty victory because one man was willing to serve God even when nobody was watching. Amen? How did this start? 
rejected by his family, he goes down to top. He starts fighting the enemy when nobody's watching. God gives him victory. It comes to the attention of the people. They call him back. He tells them we're going to honor God. He says if God brings victory, then we're all going to come together and honor God going forward. They make commitment before God at Mitzvah. They're the place of God's dwelling, and they honor the Lord, and they go out, and God brings a mighty victory. There's the recipe for a victorious Christian life is to be submitted to God's will and to be sold out for God, even to the point of willing to lay down your life. When he went out and fought the battle, could he have died? What's the answer? Sure. Amen? Does every person that God sends out to, they always come back alive? Not always. Amen? He was willing to lay down his life because he knew that God was with him. Look at the apostles. They laid down their lives, and most of them lost their lives. As, impre- as impressive as the victory is, how God, it's how God brought it. He took a man who had been rejected by his own family, took a man with a difficult past, and used him wonderfully. So Jephthah is a man of the word. He's a man of great faith. He's listed in God's hall of faith. He's a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He's the kind of man or woman that God uses. Amen? So, the man or woman God uses isn't usually the one we would choose. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Secondly, it's faithful to serve even if nobody notices. I'm just going to serve God because I'm called to do it. It's a get to, not a have to. I'm not looking for accolades from men. Responds faithfully when called. So when the calling comes, you obey. You don't say, you know, when God calls you to do it, respond. You know what the response is? Yes, Lord. Amen? Yes, Lord. He uses godly wisdom in fulfilling his calling. Okay, God's called you, and now you're in the place where God's called you to be. Don't cease to be desperate for God. Can we say amen to that? Don't cease to be on your knees crying out to the Lord for help. Never think that you've arrived, because without him, you can do nothing. Be desperate always. And then finally, is willing to lay it on his life if necessary. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the picture that we saw tonight of a man that God uses. Again, not because he's mighty in the eyes of the world, not because he's gifted or chosen or charismatic from the world's perspective, but because he's a man who's faithful to you even when nobody's watching, because he's a humble man, because he's willing to be used by your kingdom. He's willing to respond to the calling you've placed upon his life. He holds no grudges against those who've wronged him. Lord, help us to be men and women like that. May we serve you when no one's watching. May we be faithful to the calling you've placed upon our lives. May we hold no grudges with those who hurt us, but may we pray for them. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, let's stand and worship.